How y'all, how y'all feeling? Everybody can hear me clearly? Um, first of all, congratulations on looking so beautiful. Y'all look beautiful out there. And, and thank you for coming out and participating in the Sankofa series. And it's my honor and my pleasure to be here in front of y'all. And um, you know, when I come to these events, um, I, don't, I don't enjoy lecturing. So I'm not going to be lecturing to y'all. I'm going to be talking. Um, I'm going to be talking about myself. I'm going to be talking about my past. I'm going to be talking about the subject matter. Um, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to be up here, you know, lecturing y'all. I want it to be more of a free, free flowing conversation. Um, so I'll start with talking about uh, my past. You know, it's the Sankofa series. So, you know, it's about the past. Um, Consciousness and hip hop, those two worlds got married for me uh, when I was in college and I started working at a bookstore called Inkiru Books in Brooklyn. Um, I think they had a bookstore out here. A, uh, there was a bookstore out here. Linda Villa Rosa had a bookstore out here, right? It was a hum human, human books. We used to buy books from human all the time back in the day. Um, but I worked at Inkiru Books. I was in college at New York University and I needed a job. And I decided that the job I was going to take would either be working at a bookstore or at a record store. Um, at Inkiru Books, which my, myself and my partner, Mos Def, who changed his name to Yasin Bey, um, we ended up purchasing the store later on. But when I worked there, one of the things that I liked to sell the most was this film, this independent film called Sankofa by uh, Haile Jarima is his name, right? How, how many people have seen this film, Sankofa? Um, so, you know, I haven't heard that term in a, in a long time. Um, you know, the idea of Sankofa is a Yoruba idea of returning to your past and, 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 and bringing things back from your past to inform your future. And that's what I think my job has been as an artist, to make the past and keep the past relevant and keep our focus on a timeline that includes past, present, and future um, because it all exists at the same time. I was born in 1975 in New York City in Brooklyn, New York. I was born to two parents who are now educators, but they met at New York University in 1969. In 1969, in New York University, there were you know, a lot of student movements, not just in New York, but universities all across the country. And my parents met and fell in love with each other's sort of activist spirit, activist revolutionary spirit. My mother was more of a women's rights, voters' rights, civil rights, uh, you know, type of scholar. And my father was more of a counterculture, listening to Bob Dylan, hanging out in Washington Square Park, but against the Vietnam War type, right? So their politics came together, and they, they uh, in 1975, I was born. In 1977, my brother was born. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of that generation. My name, Talib, is an Arabic name that my parents got from an African book. It means the student or the seeker. Kwali is a name from Makan, which is uh, people of Ghana, but it's also a name that's used in other African dialects and languages like Swahili. It means of truth and knowledge. So my name put together means seeker or student of truth and knowledge. Uh, my parents did a good job by giving me this name. Names are very important. I couldn't be no crackhead or doing no ratchet shit with a name like Talib Kwali. You know, that wouldn't even look right. So I spent a lot of my, a lot of my time in my life trying to live up to my parents, um, trying to live up to my name. Um, it wasn't just having African names, but my parents grew up at a time when the most popular thing for, for a progressive, intelligent black people was to be nationalists, to uh, move forward with the idea that we built America, we belong here, but we have to put the needs of our community first, the same way that other people who are immigrants who weren't dragged here as slaves have put the needs of their community first. Um, the idea that the concept of the melting pot that we learned when we were uh, children is, is a myth. It doesn't, it doesn't exist, and it's something that's sold to us. Um, America is not a melting pot because a melting pot is something where you come in and you put everything in and it becomes one flavor. So everything kind of loses its flavor. Um, America is a place where 
everyone's flavor is so distinct. It doesn't melt together. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Um, the only way that you can truly appreciate someone else's culture is if you love and respect your own. If you love and respect your own culture, it'll, be, it'll enable you to see the beauty in other people love and respect their culture and you, you start to appreciate it more. Um, so this is something that just made sense in my household when I was growing up with African art on the wall. We had African names. We celebrated Kwanzaa. Um, you know, we went to see um, plays by Mary Baraka. We went to see Stevie Wonder when he came into town. We, my parents would take me to the Natural History Museum when they had uh, uh, African art there. And it, it, it was very, it wasn't ever a separatist thing, but it was very, 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 very nationalistic. And, um, and so that doesn't always that doesn't always translate in the in the middle of the country. You have people who, who are on the coast who, who who do that more. So when when I when I started to travel um, as a teenager, I started traveling really early. Um, I just I, I saw that that I just assumed growing up in Brooklyn that all black people thought the same, you know, like nationalists, you know. And I, I, I quickly learned that, um, that, that not, not everybody does. Um, but I digress. Uh, my point that I'm making <laughs> is um, that this, the way that I grew up is the biggest foundation of my life. It's the biggest influence on my life more than any musician. Your parents have the biggest influence on you, even if they're not around, just from who they are. Um, and so when I started listening to hip hop music, when I was 12, 13, 14, I started listening to hip hop music for the same reason that everybody starts listening to hip hop music, because, uh, you know, I wanted to get some girls, and hip hop music was, was cool. Like, all the girls I like listen to certain songs, right? So I, I, I set about trying to learn these records, and I wanted to learn about the culture, because the girl was one girl in particular, and Stacey Cox was a girl that I liked, and she used to dance in this crew called Much Finesse, and they had these sweatshirts with the bubble letters. I said much finesse, and this was like, this was like 89, right? So it was like 88, so it was like girls wearing biker shorts, you know, and I just like, used to love to see the girls in the biker shorts, and that's what really made me want to rap, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> biker shorts, you know? Um, but I had this consciousness and this foundation um, from the home, right? So when I got in, involved in hip hop, the rappers I gravitated towards was Public Enemy, and KRS-One, Boogie Down Productions, and at that time, you know, I actually, to, to speak on Run DMC, Run DMC, when I got into hip hop, Run DMC was already a big pop group. You know what I'm saying? Like, Run DMC was already on MTV all the time. Walk This Way was huge, and it's interesting, my mother's an English professor. The first Run DMC record I really liked was You Be Illin', because they used to play that on pop radio, but I, I felt like You Be Illin' was a record that didn't compromise what Run DMC did in order to get on radio. Like, Walk This Way is a great record. It's one of the greatest records of all time, the Aerosmith version and the Run DMC version. But in order for Run DMC to get that love, they had to do a rock and roll song. The next song was You Be Illin'. And, I, and anytime I think of that era, I think of how my mother used to, it used to be on the radio, and my mother used to be like, you can't say You Be Illin'. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't say You Be Illin'. That don't even make no sense. Um, but, yeah, so Run DMC, but Run DMC was kind of, in the stratosphere by that time. I was, it was more like, it was more of a New York City, like the rappers I was listening to was only based in, in New York at that time or in the East Coast at that time. So um, I just, I gravitated towards that and it made sense. The things that became trendy and popular and don't get it twisted because consciousness in hip hop music was a trend at some point. It, it, was, it was trendy and you had the rappers who was good at it like Boogie Down Productions and, and, and Public Enemy. And you had artists who was conscious just because of they, where they grew up and they was 5%. They, they had rhymes about girls, they had rhymes about other things, but the consciousness still came through like Rakim and Big Daddy Kane, even Slick Rick to a certain degree, right? So you had all this stuff going on. And then you had lesser known artists like a Rakim Shabazz or like a Gangstar at the time, you know, where it was like, it, it seemed like it was just a, 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 trend, a, a trendy thing. And, the trend was so prevalent, it became fake. A lot of the conscious hip hop of that era became fake. People were just getting on and getting popular because they were participating in the trend. Um, NWA came and, and shattered all that because 
they bucked the trend. You know, Ice Cube and them, they was making um, conscious hip hop records. Fuck the Police is a conscious hip hop record. Dope Man, Dope Man, that's a conscious hip hop record, right? But they had got frustrated with, with the, the fraudulent, the fakeness that was going on in the trendy conscious hip hop, where it's like if you didn't have on a kufi or a dashiki, then no one was taking you seriously. That's why they came out like we niggas with attitudes, we got on Raiders hats, we wear all black. Like, it, yeah, it was like, it's, everything can become corny and false, you know? Um, so this type of, this type of active, in order, at, at that time, even if you were NWA, because Ice Cube ended up when he left NWA going to work with the Bomb Squad and getting with Public Enemy and making America's Most Wanted, which is a conscious gangster rap album, right? Um, these things all inform me as I got kicked out of school, all right? I got kicked out of Brooklyn Tech High School because I was cutting. I was missing, I missed six months of school. I was a truant, I was a juvenile delinquent, and we used to just, and it was all, it was really because of rapping. Like I would show up at school at 8.30 in the morning, I would check in the homeroom, and then I would leave and go to McDonald's where they was battling at McDonald's. Then I would come back for lunch, and Brooklyn Tech had 5,000 kids, four different sections in the high school, and four different lunch periods. So you could do lunch four times a day if you just went to you know, every different section. And each, each lunch section was a different crew of MCs, so I would just, I just, I really, my freshman year of high school, I just rapped in the lunchroom, and then I would have hooky parties at my house. So after the lunch, we all would go to my house and drink 40s. But at the same time, because of how I grew up, and this brings it back to my parents, I was on the train reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and Nigger by Dick Gregory and Man Child in the Promised Land and stuff like that. And I, was, I would cut school and go see Al Sharpton talk about Tawana Brawley. Or we would cut school and march across the Brooklyn Bridge for Yusuf Hawkins. The consciousness was still there. I was participating in a movement called Black Watch, which was prevalent in the high schools at the time. Black Watch had a rap group. Black Watch was started by Sonny Carson, who's an activist, son, Lamuma Carson. Lamuma Carson known the hip pop fans is Professor X from the rap group X-Clan. X-Clan was the music part of Black Watch. But Black Watch, it was all, we was all, you know, trying to chase girls and drink at 40s and all that, but we still was, had the, had the, had the African inspired gear and we still was going to these events. It was like, it was almost like, I don't know, I, I, I know that that's from the foundation that was in the home, um, that's married to the music. When I, um, I got kicked out, I got sent to boarding school. I went to Cheshire Academy and Cheshire, Connecticut. Um, and now I learned about white people. You know, I, I thought I knew about white people living in New York City, because there's plenty of them, you know, but I, I, learned, I learned a lot about white people at Cheshire Academy. Um, the, the most important thing I learned, not about white people, but about the white world that I was about to enter, the most important thing I learned at Cheshire was to make myself indispensable. And so the school at the time was taking advantage of me by, they took my money from my parents, right? And then they, um, they um, I, was, I was a tour guide, I was on the honor roll, and they used to, I was like, I was the proof of diversity at this school. Um, but at the same time, I was able to flip it um, and I was able to use that to, you know, navigate the system. Like I would, I would, I would hand in lyrics to Karis one songs for reports. Like we would learn about Mesopotamia, you know, the cradle of civilization, right? And Karis has this record called Black Man in Effect on edutainment. We talks about, I'm listening to this record and this is what we learn in history. I just wrote the lyrics down. And I remember I told a professor once that the, that the research papers was culturally biased and I got to write my research paper on De La Soul is dead. Um, you know, stuff like that, like really incorporating this, 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 this hip hop into my life. Um, I ended up going to NYU, coming full circle because my parents met there and I ended up going there on a theater scholarship. Um, but I quickly realized when I was in college that I wanted to rap for a living. I was working for Jessica Rosenblum, who was a promoter in New York City. Her partners at the time were Funkmaster Flex and, and Puff Daddy. And they used to throw these uh, elaborate parties that I used to promote for. Um, and so I, I had developed my rap style over time. And I, I, when I was in college, I really felt like I was the best rapper. 
Like I really felt like I was better than people I was hearing on the radio, or at least as good. And then because I was working for Jessica, I would see these people at these parties. So it was all, it was all tangible. And so that's what, what part of my decision was to leave schools that I saw it right in front of me and decided that I could, I could become a rapper. Um, and so I put out, started, I started taking that seriously. The more seriously I took it, the more successful I got. Um, I left college and about two years later I had a record on a company called Raucous um, that we put out, me and most deaf and my man, Mr. Man. But what was interesting is that I was only making the type of hip hop that I grew up listening to and the type of hip hop that I came in the game listening to um, and the type of hip hop that I wanted to hear. But I had respect for commercial hip hop. When, 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 I, when I came like, you know, I had respect for what, the, what was going on in the radio. When I came into the game, the radio was playing Gangstar and Souls of Mischief and on, on commercial radio. So it was never this divide between underground hip hop and commercial hip hop. It was like, if you listen to hip hop, you was just down. You know, like, like Diddy was at all the early, Diddy and Biggie and all of them was at the early Lyricist Lounge showcases right there with us. So it was never the separation. By the time my career started, there was this separation between underground and quote unquote conscious hip hop and then what it was called fake rap or you know, uh, you know, yeah, you know, like she said, you know. Um, but it, you know, it, to me it was, it was never, I, I didn't realize the difference and understand how different it was. And so, you know, Biggie, when Biggie passed away in 96, um, Diddy came to a lyricist lounge. He was Puffy then, so I'll just keep it relevant to the time. Puffy came to Lyricist Lounge, and he came like three weeks after Biggie had passed away. And Lyricist Lounge was like me and most deaf, excuse me, Yasin, stomping grounds. Um, and I remember being happy to see him, but the crowd was just like, boo, you know? And I wasn't, I remember not being mad at the Bad Boy Records when they was out. Like I was like, I was loving the locks and Mace and Biggie and Little Kim. But the audience that I was now associated with, the audience people I was rapping with, they wasn't, they was like, no, that's the enemy. You know, that's separate. And I never really got that. So I, I remember doing interviews back then when people used to be like, people used to be like, yo, what do you think of Diddy? I'd be like, yo, Diddy, that's my best friend. You know, I love Diddy. He's just, and most used to, I remember most, they used to be like, what do you, what do you think of Diddy? He was like, well, you know, we, we used to go out, you know, he kept the TV and the plants. You know, he used to make a joke on the fact that people always wanted our opinion on Jay-Z and Diddy as if we was in a relationship with them, you know, it's like, and they, and we just, we really, really, really didn't look at it like that. But like the gentleman said, uh, 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 when we were on Raucous, we decided to put out a record. Amadou Diallo was an African immigrant who was shot 41 times by NYPD, and these police um, were not uh, charged, uh, uh, for their crimes, and um, you know, we put together a record with 41 MCs uh, at the time. Uh, popular artists at the time, from De La Soul to Coogee Rap to Sporty Thieves to Rod Digger, to this was a lot of people on it. And I, I just assumed the radio would play it, and they they did. Organized Noise did the beat. Outcast was cracking at the time, um, still cracking for forever. But um, I, you know, the radio did not play that. No, nothing. No, the magazines did not support it. The industry did not support it, and that was the first time I realized that that there might be like it felt like there was an active trend against consciousness and against intelligence and the music. And I'm not one for conspiracy theories, and I'm not one who believes that my destiny is controlled by some major label or some Illuminati or some outside force that controls my life. Clearly, it doesn't control my life. But that was a moment of darkness for me, where I was like, "Wow, they really not fucking with this," you know. They really want us to be dumb, deaf and blind. That's how they want us to be. But, you know, one of the greatest experiences I had was walking down Flappish Avenue when that record was out and having a kid come up to me and say, I never, ever, ever thought about being a conscious artist. I'm an artist, right? And I grew up listening to Tupac and Biggie and I love all DMX and The Locks. I love all these artists. And never crossed my mind to do anything uplifting or positive or spiritual until I heard that record. And it, it dawned on me that, you know, it's a cliche, but it's a true, true statement. If you could reach one person, then you did that job. And, and I'm sure that there were other people I reached like that. It didn't have to be spoken to me. But having that spoke to me, spoken to me in that one instant brought me back to, real, to not 
playing the victim role and being like, oh, the industry is against me. You know, like, I don't, you don't never hear me complaining about any other artists. Before I complain about another artist and what they not doing, I'm going to go make a song and do what I think they should be doing. You know, I'm going to participate in the culture. Um, too often we complain about hip-hop culture and we don't participate in it. You know, you can't complain about, you know, stuff that's on the radio if you're not calling up to the radio and voicing your opinion. You know, radio is, you pay taxes. That's what, this radio is free, free airwaves. That's, you own the airwaves. So what's being played on the radio is what you want to hear. That sounds like, you know, that might sound real corporate, but it's, it's, it's true. Now, what you want to hear is affected by all types of different social con conditions, of course, but it doesn't mean that it can't be changed. It can be changed because you, you, you are the leaders. I'll, artists, I said this to the kids in the, in the class just now, artists are followers. Artists will follow where people go. When Ray Charles wanted to play Georgia and the people were like, no, Ray, we can't support you because Georgia, they don't let black people and they segregate. Ray Charles had to, had to not play it, even though he wanted to get that bread. When James Brown had a con, you know, he said, um, the people was like, James, James, we not, we not fucking with your, with your, with your con, bro, you know? He, he got an afro and he made him say loud, I'm black and I'm proud, you know? But this is, this is, this is as a result, you know, when Young Jeezy did My President is Black, it wasn't because, you know, some intellectual academic, you know, series said, you know, Jeezy, you need to make more conscious records, man. Uh, it's because the community raised a leader in, in Barack Obama that was able to inspire this artist. It wasn't the artist inspired him. I mean, it's, it's of course symbiotic. It goes in a circle, but, but you know, it's, it definitely starts with the people. It definitely starts with the community without a shadow of a doubt. Um, when we did the Amadou Diallo record in 1999, and because of the stance that we took and the type of records we were doing, I got involved with a lot of wonderful activists, a lot of organizations, and I became the voice for a struggle. Uh, Refuse and Resist, which is an organization dedicated to the freedom of Mumia Abu-Jamal, was the first organization that I was really like at all their fundraisers. And I met people, um, you know, the, the idea that people can be jailed for their thoughts or people can be uh, falsely accused of crimes because of their uh, politics um, resonates with me. And I, I just feel like we can't leave these people. I feel like these people have given everything so that we could be sitting here in these wonderful institutions. And, and we can't ever forget about them. And this is something that goes back to my nationalist past. Um, I started working with Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, which is a more involved uh, organization to help political prisoners. Uh, it was not just about political prisoners, it's about helping political prisoners and also realizing um, the impact that putting these people in prison has had on a community and trying to raise new leaders in the community. Um, because of the, the people at Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, they started uh, a Black August series where they would take a group of artists and a group of activists and journalists and writers and we'd go visit a community that needed help um, I haven't been with them on all of their trips. I performed at just about all their fundraisers, but I went with them to South Africa. I went with them to Cuba. Um, and, you know, I started getting, I, because of all these activities, I started to maybe lose control of my image. Um, you know, to be called a conscious artist, a positive artist, an uplifting artist is a positive, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. I take all those things as compliments, but they're very limiting to my artistry. What if I want to make uh, a song that's decadent? What if I want to not be responsible? I'm, I'm an, you know, when I, when I go in the studio, I don't think about being a conscious person. I think about making the best art I can do, I can make. The type of person I am, and it forms my art. I'm not always positive, I'm not always conscious. And so, you know, I, tr I strive to be, but often I'm not. And so my music has to be an honest, in my opinion, my music has to be an honest reflection of who I am. Um, there are artists who disagree with that, who I respect. I love their music. Dead Prez, uh, The Cool, my man Boots, you know, um, Michael Franti from Spearhead. There are artists who say that we're activists first, and the art is a vehicle to get our message out. Um, and I think most, 
hip hop fans who like conscious music, they feel that way. But I challenge them on that. Um, and this is why I put the art first, because I truly believe if, if I truly believe if M1 and Stickman weren't as good as making music as they were, you wouldn't care what they had to say at all. Most people, you know, who, who do listen to them. I truly believe that the reason why I'm able to amass these people is not because of the content of what I'm saying, it's because of the skill level and, and the, the art of it. Um, and because my job is someone with knowledge to spread that knowledge. If I have the knowledge, I don't spread it, I'm being fraudulent, I'm not doing my, my job. But too often we expect people to have knowledge, to spread knowledge who don't have it. And we're asking babies to be a re responsible for adult themes. Um, and so we have, to, we have to be cognizant of that and aware of that when we criticize artists and, and not criticize young artists who are speaking from oppress, oppressed places and trying to express themselves, but criticize program directors who might play Rack City at three in the afternoon as opposed to three in the morning in the strip club. Because I, I love that record, that's a great record. In the strip club, it's a great record, it makes perfect sense. It does, you know? But at three o'clock in the afternoon when you're picking up your kid from school, you might not want to hear, man, he got a new one out. Y'all heard Tiger a new record? Make it nasty. He say, in the lyric, he's like, make it nasty. Something, something, gotta gag me. Something, I was like, I heard that on the radio this morning at 9.30 in the morning. That's the first time I was like, whoa. <laughs> Drop it on the flow, make it nasty. <laughs> and, and